the PlayStation generation onward, the survival horror genre exploded everywhere like an excited pubescent male's first time seeing a semi-naked body. Series such as Resident Evil and Silent Hill cemented in the player a fear of the unknown. The early games in these series fed on the player's fears and anxious sensibilities to create an atmosphere unlike any experienced in a game before. But where did this all begin? While some may suggest that Sweet Home for the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the Famicom in Japan, was the beginning of the survival horror genre, I want to also pay tribute to Human Entertainment's Clock Tower, which never officially saw the light of day outside of Japan. Where Sweet Home equipped characters with the ability to defend themselves, and permanently fight off their assailants, Clock Tower relegates the player to the role of a 14-year-old girl desperately trying to escape a seemingly hopeless situation. Clock Tower embodies the zeitgeist of the horror movement, however subverts the damsel in distress trope. Our protagonist is all alone and stuck in a mountainous region of Norway, so there is no one around to save her. Released for the Super Famicom in Japan in 1995, Clock Tower became the first in a series of games that centers around a female protagonist who must investigate why murders and sometimes paranormal situations occur in her presence. The Clock Tower games use atmosphere to portray horror, whilst pitting the player against an unwinnable situation to provide the survival aspect. Together, these elements present a game that is an interesting first delve into the survival horror genre, and forms a linchpin for what the genre will become in the future. Most of the games in the canonical series are point-and-click adventure titles, apart from Clock Tower 3, which was developed by Konami, a separate entity. In Clock Tower, you take on the role of Jennifer Simpson, an unassuming young girl who has just been adopted by the Burroughs family. Along with three other orphans, they travel together to the Burroughs mansion, with Mary Burroughs, who has adopted them. It isn't until the girls are left alone, when Miss Burroughs goes off to find her husband, that things start to go downhill. After some time being left alone, Jennifer offers to go look for the matron. Soon into her investigation, she hears a scream from the parlour. Returning there, she discovers that the other girls are missing. Thinking that it's just a joke, she is soon jerked to reality when she stumbles upon the dead body of one of the other orphans and has a frank, dramatic encounter with the game's main antagonist, Scissor Man. Scissor Man, not to be confused with the robot with scissors on his head from Mega Man, is the main threat to Jennifer's life in Clock Tower. He is not the only danger to Jennifer's life, however, as certain actions can also lead to her demise. Whilst exploring the Barrow's mansion, Jennifer may sometimes encounter Scissor Man, or a number of paranormal activities that can end her journey. In such situations, Jennifer is thrown into a panic and must fight or flight. This is indicated by her portrait flashing in the lower left screen. If you mash the panic button while she is in this state, there is a possibility that she can survive. However, Jennifer's state of mental well-being is denoted by the colour of a portrait. If it is blue, she is fine. The closer to red it becomes, the less stable she is, and she will trip when running away, or have less chance of surviving an attack from Scissor Man. The key to winning the game is ensuring that her portrait is blue as much as possible, to give her a good fighting chance. This isn't easy, however, as even a simple action such as running can change her mood. To keep the portrait blue, you can either walk through the mansion, or have Jennifer sit on the ground to catch your breath and calm down. On the subject of Scissor Man, however, he isn't really all that intimidating a foe. Sure, the first few encounters with him are nerve-wracking because as the player, you are unsure of where you can go to evade him. However, once you figure this out, it becomes a simple matter of returning to the same place to evade him time and time again. A guaranteed place to evade Scissor Man is the plank on the second floor balcony near the sealed room. Every time you come back to this spot, if you are being pursued by Scissor Man, you can pull the plank and make him fall. Since he is so easy to avoid, even though he can pursue Jennifer relentlessly through rooms, he becomes more of a nuisance than an immediate threat, like one of a fly that persistently buzzes around the room just out of reach. As a player, you are encouraged to play the game multiple times. There are several endings that can be achieved, which are based on the actions performed by Jennifer within the game. Additionally, each new game will randomize the locations of some of the rooms in the Barrow's Mansion, as well as display some of the keys and items required to progress the story. In this way, it's impossible to predict where the items will be without a guide, so replays to get additional endings become more tedious. Additionally, some rooms will have jump scares that will activate randomly, such as a television randomly turning on, or a scream being heard as Jennifer runs through a corridor. 
This makes each playthrough a little different, but it's not unique enough to ease the frustration at Jennifer's slow pace. You'd think she was browsing a retail outlet for the best bargains and not fighting for her life. And don't get me started on a lack of discretion, as her elephant feet when she's walking is enough to wake the dead. Items that Jennifer pick up can be accessed via an inventory that is opened by pressing the B button. Unlike other games of the point and click genre, it's not possible to combine items, nor are there separate cursors denoted to the action of examining, using items in the inventory, or in the environment. In this regard, the gameplay is streamlined, which is handy considering that the game is not on a PC platform, and does not support Super Famicom mouse input. However, despite the system being streamlined, even if you as the player know what Jennifer must do in a situation, she will not do it unless you have completed a predetermined set of events. For example, when obtaining the black robe, Jennifer will not push the box against the wardrobe until after she's failed to climb it. After this, you can then click on the box and she'll be able to use it to boost herself up. Another example is in trying to get past the dog in the underground. You cannot use the required items until Jennifer tries to pass the dog first, aggravating it in the process. I didn't like this aspect of the game, as it sometimes made Jennifer seem like she really didn't have a clue, although given her age, maybe she doesn't. As the game was made toward the end of the Super Famicom's life cycle, the pixel art is all very detailed, and I was often amazed by even some of the minor details in animation, such as Scissorman flipping over after being knocked down by Jennifer. The only complaint I would have about the game's graphics is that many of the corridor areas besides the colour of the wallpaper, looked the same, so it's easy to get confused about where you are. Despite this, the attention to detail that went into the animations and the objects placed around the mansion really made it feel like a lived-in family home, even if the inhabitants are out to kill Jennifer and her friends. What I will say though, is that the animation of Jennifer's face when she finds herself in a dangerous situation is brilliant. I loved how the portrait suddenly becomes a close-up of her shocked eye, the effect of taking a real picture and digitizing it worked really well. Also, the rare moments when you got to get story exposition with an image in the background was a nice touch. The game is rarely accompanied by music, and instead you are treated to the sound of Jennifer's footsteps and sometimes ambient sounds. In the event of being pursued by Scissorman, and when he is first revealed, music will play to denote this. Whilst the musical score is very limited, the tracks that exist are interesting and ones I have found myself listening to outside of playing the game. The soundscape and ambient sounds adequately set the mood for the mansion and provide tension and anxiety where necessary. Clock Tower was developed and released on the Super Famicom toward the end of its life cycle and given the strict policies of Nintendo of America, it's not hard to see why the game never made it to the West. Nevertheless, despite some of my complaints about the game, I would recommend it even for just one playthrough to experience it for yourself. Though it has no official translation, there have been some unofficial translation patches produced, and other translations have been made of the game's text outside of the game, so it's not that difficult to access these days. By the way, what is your favourite horror game? Personally, I haven't really looked at games outside of the primary Silent Hill and Resident Evil series, so I'm always up for recommendations. Please let me know in the comments. As always, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again for another review in the near future. Bye bye for now.